joined by our in-house analyst and a political economist who is a regular on the program, a social affairs commentator and someone who is very passionate about the affairs of the country, Mr. Lam Mr. Lamlekon Adefolarin, who is uh, joining us in the studio right now. But I think you prefer me to call you Adefolarin. Adefolarin or Lamlekon. Yes, yes. Well, it's uh, wonderful to have you in the studio again. Mm -hmm. It's been a minute. Exactly. And a lot of things have happened since <laughs> the last time we had our discussion on the program. Exactly. And I quickly, may quickly render my apology to all our viewers that expected me to be here last week yeah. to the, you know, the body was not that too strong. You just have to go for some medication and thank God I'm back. Well, thank God you're back. I'm feeling <laughs> better, bouncing exactly. stronger. Exactly. Well, let's uh, get to action. The good news for the Nigerian judici judiciary. Mm. The federal government has uh, stated that they have begun the implementation of a 300% salary increment for all judicial workers. Mm. This is coming as the FCT minister yesterday commissioned a 40-unit housing for judges in uh, the Karsana area of the FCT. Exactly. Or oh, Katampi area Katampi of the SCA, area. I beg your pardon. Mm. Now, uh, is it that uh, the coming of the new uh, CJN as well as uh, President Bola Metinibu's drive mm. towards the judiciary is uh, one that has been that is unprecedented because it appears the judiciary is enjoying all the benefits in the country right now. We should expect that because we many of us have cried out that the judiciary has not been well taken care of. Yeah. I could remember 10 15 years ago, I had the opportunity of doing some write up on the welfare of the judiciary, especially the criminal justice system in Nigeria. And one of the problems we had there was that the judiciary had not been well taken care of, particularly judges. Their salary is nothing to talk about. Their welfare package is nothing to talk about. They don't have accommodation for themselves. And uh, over the years, a lot of government come and promise one or two things. But good enough, the current government increased their salary to over 300%. They also make provision for housing for them. But I'm not also surprised that the current minister of FCT has been someone who is from also that background. You know, he's from the law background. Yes. So he understood what judges are suffering from writing with long hand not be able to digitalize the process of the court system in Nigeria. So, and he know basically that the, one of the key issues with the welfare of judges is that they don't have good accommodation. Apart from they not being paid well, they suffer accommodation problem because judges have to live in rented apartments. And he coming into power at, as a governor in River State, he changed the narrative. He built court, he built law school, he also built uh, judiciary quarters for judges in River State. So when he came into Abuja as Minister of FCT, we all expected that he's going to do something great in that magnitude. And he has started. He, there is a 40 uh, unit housing in different categories for judges in FCT. And he says he's going to do more because the judges in FCT are close to 138 of them, both the magistrate court, Sharia court, and the rest of them. So he's going to build houses for them at the end of the day. So we, we expect him to do more. And this 40 knows that he's, he's starting with is a good one. We just hope that they will complete it on time and the judges will move in. And the new set of 40 or 50 they are talking about yeah. will also start they finish the entire houses for the entire judges in FCT. And this should be a lesson for other states. Like Nassau State, for instance, their, their judges don't have quarters. Yes. I have to say, Nassau State government need to do something about quarters for judges. And not just for judges, including judicial staff or workers who also get accommodation. I can remember some years back, we have like a court of appeal quarters, Supreme Court quarters, High Court quarters across FCT. But because of the monetization exercise of the government between 2003, and 2007, they sold out those houses to staff who want to buy, and they also sold some of them to individuals who want to buy. But most of those quarters now have been taken over by private owners, owners and they are turning it around into mega estate. Yes. The one in Cairo, the one in Dede, and the rest of them. If you go there, you won't know that it was formerly for judiciary staff quarters that they were staying there, but they have not been turned into mega estate. So, what we are saying is that we expect this good. Uh, good is to spread around to judiciary and it is spreading around to judiciary just like the minimum wage also be increased for civil servant but we expect more from the government to take care of many of nigerian workers but but many i i, I believe that uh, the question here mm. is that why a 300 percent salary increment mm. only for the judiciary uh, when other state governors or when around the country state governors are grappling with the reality of paying 70,000 naira minimum wage, which is just a little over a hundred percent increase exactly. from the 30, uh, 30,000. It was just 40 percent increase. Wage. 40 percent increase. That's what happened in the minimum wage. You no, know, in, in the area of judiciary, I think the federal government started by saying their own judicial staffs, yes, 300 percent. 
Now, it's not left for governors to also take a cue into that. At, uh, Lagos State have done. Lagos State is paying up to 300% for their judges okay. in terms of welfare, in terms of their salaries. Lagos is always on. It's always sad. And, and uh, those states also wanted to do the same. Although you can't compare some of those states. That, like Lagos has over 200 judges because of the multitude of court that they have in Lagos. They have over 200 judges that they are taking care of. Other states do may not have up to that number. Like the national state that I mentioned, they don't even have, have up to 150 judges. You get it? So it depends on the state. And it also depends on the activities of the court in the state. The governors look at that. But the, 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 the way bill of the state also matters. Yes. If the way bill is beyond what the state can be able to take care of, then there will be a challenge. And most states are already in debt. And some governors are not ready to leave debt for their predecessor coming 2027. So most of them are very careful. But what I'm trying to say is that we need a better welfare for for judiciary even though you cannot get up to 300 percent but get something better for them and ensure that pension after retirement is regularly paid because if they this one that the fct is building now if they retire they're going to leave the house they're not going to live there forever they will only live there within the period they are serving the government or serving the people after retirement they move out but we, be, we most of us believe and other acknowledge that most times when judges are living after retirement there's always a pay package that is far, far higher than even the wages they collect when they're in service. That's interesting. Well, let's uh, move away from the mm. issue of uh, the 300% salary increment. Mm. Uh, well, good news for Nigerians again, mm. as uh, President Tinubu is uh, launching a bid to raise oil pr output by 1 million barrels per day exactly. in the next 12 months. Mm. Now, if you were, I believe you were watching and uh, you had a better insight into uh, this particular development, especially now that there is a scuffle between Nangote Refinery and mm -hmm. NPCL, where Nangote is dragging them to court. <laughs> <laughs> what what are we looking at? Is, uh, is, is this really good news for Nigeria? Uh, let's take uh, the issue of the 1 million barrel per day that the government is targeting. Yes. You know, if you look at 2024 budget, let's go back to 2023 budget. The target of uh, oil production was below 1.4 million barrel per day. Now, in the 2024 budget, it was 1.7 million barrel per day, and government have not been able to meet up with that. And the OPEC quota is about 2 million barrel per day for all their members. And Nigeria is the only country that has been falling below. Nigeria and Angola have always been struggling, it's going to be the leading oil production uh, in Africa. And both of them have always racket it out. But Angola has always been ahead of us. And we cannot forget that there have always been issues within our oil production areas, particularly insecurity, uh, pipeline vandalism, militancy oil theft and all manner of uh, shenanigans and normally happen within that sector that even the government is not able to unravel because sometimes we need to pinpoint that the government and could also be some of those problems created yes. within that sector so the oil production has been very low but the nigerian uh, nigerian upstream petroleum regulatory agency Nupric was not saying that they are going to intensify their production uh, area whereby they're going to be producing over an additional one, one million per day to what is already being produced it's a good uh, uh, target for them, but this insecurity within that sector is still remain a challenge. One is oil theft. Who are the people carrying out oil theft? Have they been able to identify oil theft? Because oil theft affects most of the uh, production in that area. Then vandalism of pipeline uh, material is also very, very key. Have they been able to address that? Then it has also been discovered because I remember some months back I was participating in the oil and gas discussion on one of our national TV, foreign TV per se. And the challenge we discovered was that most of the oil rigs in Nigeria Delta are already old. The ones that oil companies are using are already old. Some of them are suffering from uh, uh, wheels and tires in the sense of the, uh, the deflection of the materials. So it's also contribute to low production in that area. So if Nupric is saying that they're going to improve in production by 1 million per day, have they been able to address some of the challenges in that area? Oil theft, vandalism, uh, uh, old and obsolete equipment that are being used and other uh, uh, production challenges yes. that have been identified. Have they been able to address that? And again, when we talk about this 1 million, who is producing the 1 million? Is it an NPC? Is it Nupric? Is it a private oil firm? Because we know that over the years, it is a private firm that is producing oil for Nigeria. An NPC, even with all their joint ventures, don't have one single rig planted in any area in Nigeria where they normally explore oil. So if the oil, if the private sector are the one who are going to produce it, would they be able to give accurate data? Yes. But there was a time that we have been suggested that a meter should be added or put in place so that when we say we are producing one million, we can read it from the meter that actually one million have been produced. Has been produced. So 
these are the challenges we just hope that maybe with what uh Nupik is saying mr komola fed the md of uh, Nupik, they are celebrating that three years of government establishing Nupik as a result of the pia petroleum industrial act being on bondu and ensuring the nmpc on board into three agency nmpcl Nupik, then nmprd these are the agencies that were created out of the old nmpc that we have before so Nupik is celebrating its three years i believe that nmpdrt also be celebrating that so it was out of that objective uh, achievement over the years or three years that uh, Mr. Kumala is talking about, they also target one million barrel per day. Now, now there's also another development here, mm. uh, still relating to oil, where it says that the federal government has approved the Exxon Mobil Seplat divestment mm -hmm. uh, deal mm. while declining the Shell Renaissance deal mm. on the side. You uh, know, it's, 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 it's politics of the oil and gas sector. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Now, mm. now, now I, I believe somebody watching right now, you are a political economist, mm. and you tend to understand this better than most people. Mm. Can you dissect this and simplify it in such a way that the ordinary Nigerian watching right now would mm. have a clearer understanding as mm. to the implications of this particular decision mm. by the federal government? It's quite uh, interesting that this issue has been on the table for over three years. The government of President Buhari shy away from that particular decision to support any deal because we, it was discovered that major oil companies, the international oil company, IOC, are diversifying their investment out of Nigeria, Action Mobile, Shell, Chevron, all of them. They are leaving one way or the other. Not they are leaving entirely. They are leaving a segment because they all control different oil rigs in the Niger Delta. So there are some areas that they feel that it is not safe for them to operate. They will want to sell it out. Then Shell has issues. Shell also want to Shell also want to sell out their some of their investment in Nigeria and uh, it was a big a big problem big problem in the sense that shell have been accused as the most uh, uh, corrupt and the most disorganized oil company in nigeria that i mean the whole situation in, those, in, the, in the niger delta exactly the oil spillage, mm -hmm. spillage all the years it has, the blame has always been put on shell, on shell exactly. although we have two shell we have shell international we have shell nigeria yes and and most of the things that have been put is on the shell in Nigeria and the Shell International because the mother country and the daughter countries are operating here in Nigeria. Now, for Exxon Mobil, they want to leave. But not, in, not that they are leaving entirely. They just want to leave a particular segment of the oil and gas sector and hand it over to a, to a local oil company, which is Saplat. And it has been on the deal. It uh, started with the pricing. You know, they started with about five billion US dollars. They started bargaining, discussing, and uh, the, the risk investment was carried out on that particular investment area. And the supplier believed that 1.28 billion is okay. And for over two years, uh, Action Mobile refused to also do that. In the sense that they were playing the games that they, they want another international oil company to take over. Meanwhile, the interest of the Nigerian government was that a local oil company should, should have that. And that's why they were pushing supplier to go. I think Sahara Energy and the rest of them, their local company, also bid for that particular their investment. But uh, uh, supplier has been on the edge. In the sense that it has been making a bid that is quite appealing to Exxon Mobil, and you can see that after about three years, that deal has been sold through. Then for Shell, Shell also want to leave, but now they want to leave, and people are complaining about all the baggages of their exploitation or their <laughs> that, pollution that, that they need to clean <laughs> up. They need to clean up, clean up. And then uh, for Shell, Shell have said they have done their bid; they have dropped over three billion US dollar for the clean up. You get it that they don't have any blame to be. They don't have any, nobody need to blame them for anything at this point in time. But the Ogoni people, which who has been on the receiving end of Shell, will always say that Shell have not done anything. Even though have a, we have a lot of children of uh, Niger Delta working in Shell. They will say they have not done anything, even with the employment. The rest of them. So for Shell, the Renaissance deal has not gone to because there is still a baggage of problem that Shell need to claim. Particularly the political angle of it. Because what have helped Exxon Mobil supply to succeed was that there was no too much politi political strings around the deal than just that it must be for a local oil company that must take that, that divestment, not a foreign company anymore. And that was the stand of the government. But for Shell, they, they, I believe that they, they are going to hand over that aspect to a local oil company, but they have to clean up some of the challenges that they have, particularly settling their differences with uh, the Ogoni people. And you can see that a lot of uh, civil society have been coming out that Shell must not leave. If they want to leave, the over 28 billion US dollar uh, uh, investment they have in the country must be put in a place whereby the data people must benefit. And that's why if you, if you see the Exxon Mobil own, 
that your data people are really benefiting. Now, now let me it. get your take on uh, NNPCL's comments uh, at a time when Angote Refinery is dragging them to court, mm. but also saying that uh, they are withdrawing the one hundred million, uh, one hundred million dollars uh, suit mm. labeled on uh, Dangote Refinery. They said that Dangote Refinery has failed to meet the one point zero six five billion liters supply. Plant supplied 317 million liters in 35 days, and no new case in court, Dangote Refinery has said. Mm. In this situation, I'm, I'm wondering when will the whole scuffle between Dangote Refinery and NNPCL end? Mm. It's, it's, it appears that they are the only two giants in the oil and gas industry right now that are basically two elephants fighting and Nigerians. Are the ants suffering it on the ground? But, but, but let me shock you. NNPC and Dangote are not fighting. Well, what is it then? Is, is it just a media show up? It's just media paparazzi. It's just a, a, a misunderstanding by some stakeholders in that sector. If you check the news that came out, there was no source whether it was NNPC that is talking yes. or whether there's Dangote that is talking. And on, if, on, on one hand, Dangote yes, said that they are dragging them to court. On the other hand, they are saying they are withdrawing it. So no, no, what, that's, what, why, what that's why, that's why I said, take the one of the withdrawal. Okay. Now, in June, there was a court case yes. between NMPC and, and uh, uh, Dangote dragged them to court. Yes. And it as a result of that testing issue about the sofas in the uh, Dangote, yes. the so and the rest of the... Scots. So those are the issues because it was legally advised that Dangote should seek legal redress over an, an embarrassment caused by Nigerian Mainstream downstream petroleum regulatory authority who brought that shame to Dangote that they should go for a legal redress. And after the uh, House of Assembly intervened, after the presidency intervened, there was need for Dangote to withdraw that case. Yes. But unfortunately, people who are in the, the stakeholders in that sector who love to just create a scene are now using that to create a scene through the media and say, okay, if you check all the media houses, a lot of contradictory. A, a news because report, yes, particularly the one that is saying they are going to court and they are taking over 100 billion. 100, 100 but the billion one that is very authentic era. is yeah. 100 billion in Naira. The one that is very authentic that is one coming from the corporate uh, affairs manager of Dangut, uh, communication affairs manager of Dangut, who said they are already out of court for some of these issues. Yes. Now, on the other hand, hand to the issue of 1.6 billion liters of oil that is expected to be produced by Dangut, when did they have that issue? When did they have that agreement? Dangote is a 450 barrel uh, per capacity per day capacity per day. Uh, and it's a 25 facility. million barrel uh, uh, liters of oil. So when did they agree that it would be 1.6 the the uh, on billion liters? Yeah. So we need to begin to ask this question. And for me as an analyst, particularly as political economy, to so understand yeah. some of this intent that's been created by stakeholders just to generate noise around it. I, I, I don't want to isolate that. They themselves, these two parties, NMPC and Dangote, not that they don't play a string, they do play a string, yes. but they don't play the string to embarrass themselves in public. We must understand business people, corporate business. They don't, they don't play a string to embarrass themselves and cause confusion, just like the price tango that we had about some few weeks, who we increased to 1,013 naira, and it was 849 naira we are selling, it was 850 we are buying. All this at the end of the day, when, when the whole matter was open, it was discovered that it was just mischief maker that was just making noise around or making narrative around some of these things. So, for me, there's no scramble between NMP and that. They are business partner. They are doing business. NMP is making money for government, making money for its investors. Dangut is making money for himself, making money for his investors and trying to pay back some of the money borrowed to pay to build the refinery. So that's what they are just doing. And on the issue of importation, all of us have been against importation of PMS. I think that's where I have to take a stand. All of us have been against importation of PMS. There's been a string being played by independent multi-petroleum marketers saying that the daily production of Dangote cannot meet up with the daily consumption of Nigeria. And we ask the question. That was the time that people asked, how much of PMS are we consuming a day? So we'll say 30 million by barrels per day. Uh, no, not by 30 million liters. 30 million liters per day, per day across the country. Across the country. So we say 40 million per day. Now we have a, 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 a brand that is producing 25 million barrels per day. But, but uh, Olamilekon, mm. the question, the big <coughs> question here uh, on the table mm. is this. What modalities can be put in place to ensure that, one, the number of barrels per day that we get in terms of crude mm -hmm. is well monitored and accurately transmitted to the Nigerian populace? Mm -hmm. 
Secondly, the number of millions of liters mm. that Nigerians consume every day mm. across the country mm. should also be made public. What is the position of all of these oil and gas institutions, agencies of government in ensuring that we have a clear cut understanding of what is going on in the oil and gas industry? Because there appears to be a lot of secrecy, mm -hmm. which is fueling the continued crisis mm. in the sector. Definitely. Number one, NMPC is not doing exploration. So we can never, never know how much of crude we are taking from the ground. And, and Algote Refinery does not owe Nigerians that information? He won't get it. Now, he can only tell you the one he's buying. Yes. But I should highly ask, how much of the crude are we taking from the ground? As far as NMPC is not the one doing the dealing or bringing the crude from the ground, it is the IOC that are doing it. NMPC will never. IOC will only give you the data of the one they are doing joint ventures for the next two years, for the next three years, and they give him. And that's the one that NMPs normally brandish when they are doing the auditor, auditor, uh, annual auditor uh, portfolio uh, profiling of the organization. That's what they do to us that we hear. Now, since they are not participating in the exploration, there's no way we can know how much of it is being taken from the ground. Then number two, in terms of PMS, how much of PMS are we consuming a day? Because of st uh, smuggling, we can also know how much of it we are consuming in Nigeria because smuggling is affecting the supply chain of PMS. PMS. Smuggling and diversion. Our diversion is locally done. Whereby a filling station has all the licenses but it doesn't have the money to go and pick a fuel from a, from the from any, anywhere. So a diversion trailer is coming bringing fuel from the depot and they will just wave them down and say okay how much are you selling? If you buy for 40 now it's selling around 48 million naira per trailer per for 45,000 yeah. a truck that is 45,000 liter truck between 48 million to 52 million now a diversion will come and sell it for 65 million if the station is ready to buy it and when he's selling it will set to recover his money so that one is not taken as a record into anywhere then smuggling also happened the people that are smuggling that so also. both internally and externally there is a continued corrupt practice of definitely. either diversion or, or smuggling. smuggling definitely so that will affect affect us getting a correct data on the number of pms that we're consuming in nigeria daily well let's uh, take a look at another story in the news where in a scuffle between senator lola shiru uh, of the nigerian senate and the national drug law enforcement agency where the senator accused ndla of corruption in a very surprising twist the ndla has revealed all declared a statement saying that they found parcels of drugs in Senator Ashiru's house, and that is why he is leading a personal vendetta against the agency. This is a very much heated conversation, and Nigerians look to towards a resolution and what the end of the matter could be, with this trade of words between the senator and the agency. It's very unlikely that mm -hmm. uh, a sitting senator like mm -hmm. that will be accused by an agency of such heinous crimes mm. where they stated that they found parcels of drugs in his house in the past and that is why at the floor of the senate he's openly calling them corrupt they say in the past not now not that so. means that's happened some years back yes so the issue is that who is accusing for corruption is who is called for corruption now is it Se the senator? senator, senator the senator is mm -hmm. calling NDLEA corrupt, corrupt, saying that the agency has been compromised. Mm. Remember, some couple of weeks back, mm. there was another senator who raised concerns about the fact that within the National Assembly, they are drug peddlers, mm -hmm. even in their offices. Mm -hmm. People sell drugs. Mm. And then again, this this whole issue comes up again, and Senator Ashiru accuses NDLEA of being corrupt mm. in relation to the last statement made by the other senator. Exactly. Is it a coincidence that two times in a row, hmm. two senators are accusing NDLEA of being corrupt? And why the sharp hmm. attack on Senator you, 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 should, you should expect that sharp attack from NDLEA. And there is no agency of government that is not corrupt. All federal government, state government, local government, agencies, institutions, corruption is embell embellished in them. And what do we mean by corruption? Even changing files, hiding files, is part of corruption. So whatever form of corruption they are carrying out, any agency of government can be accused. NDLA cannot say they are not. No, the foundation of NDLA in 1987, when it was established, the first person that pioneered the agencies was accused of corruption. All other people that have occupied the offices were accused of corruption. And their staffs are also been accused of corruption. Why? Because they collect bribes. They look away from incidents that they're supposed to attack. But recently, we have seen a new change. 
But for Senator Ashiru, if drug was found in his house some years back, what did NDA do that time? Did they accuse him? Did they take him to court? So why now? Why use it against him now? That is saying that you guys are corrupt. Because we must look at that. That point that drug was found in his house. How many years ago? How many months ago? Was it up to 10 years? What did NDA do? Or is it because at that time the person in charge looked away from the issue? Can this current NDA look into the matter? Because we must ask ourselves that question. And for the issue of corruption, NDA should accept that. Every agency of government, including NDA, there's corruption. It's not necessarily until you steal money that you are, you are corrupt alone. Even doing official assignment and against the rule and act that establish your agency is corruption. So, just like the, uh, the, the senator said, there is corruption in the NDA. When drugs were found in, the, in his house some years back, what did NDA did at that time? Yes. We must ask ourselves that question. And now that he has accused guys of corruption, can you resolve the case? And, and I, I saw in one of the headlines saying that the, that the senator said, if, we are, if anybody found guilty, punish and prosecute that person. I think NDA should take it up as a challenge and bring out the five case of how drug was found in that senator's house and prosecute anybody that was found wanting. So they were trying to play this uh, game, game, uh, mind game against Nigerian or psychological but, games but, but against Nigerian. Nigerian. You're calling for a resurrection of the case that happened a couple of years ago with the allegation of parcels of drugs being found in his house. Veta. Is this not a clear court case of witch hunting if the NDLA should, should tow this part? No, no, it's not witch hunting. He has pinpointed that there is corruption in NDLA. And NDA have accused him that the man is saying they are corrupt because some years back they found some parcel of cocaine or whatever or drug in his house. Now it's not left for NDA to announce, okay, since this is the, 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 the substance of the issue, let us bring it out. And this man at that time was not prosecuted, he was not sent to jail. Can we not take over the case and review it? The statement said that some arrests were made in his house and some confiscations were made. Where are those people which, prosecuted? Which, which most likely, mm -hmm. which most likely were his aides mm. or some other people mm -hmm. just living in his house mm -hmm. and some information was leaked to the NDLA. Mm -hmm. It could have not, it might have not been the senator directly Definitely, involved. definitely, exactly. So why, why the blatant attack on the senator himself? That is how agencies normally do, including individual and CSO and investors, they normally attack people. Now, if they have not said senator house, nobody will do, read the newspaper. If they say, ah, a drug was found in the... A, 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 a get man a, a room. In Maitama or no, no, just, or just no, no, just 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 a drug parcel was found in the get man house, and you put a newspaper, put it as headline, a, and the editor put it as nobody will read that news. Nobody will read. But when you say drug parcel was found in a senator, a serving senator house, it becomes a big. It story. becomes a big story. So NDL is making a big story out of it by accusing him. Meanwhile, he also have gone back and flashed back on MDL and say, if you guys know that what you are not corrupt. You found drug in my house. Why don't you prosecute? If you have found anybody uh, guilty, why don't you prosecute? It's challenging them. So it's a challenge on NDLA to come out outright and say, okay, truly, some years back, drug was found in this man's house. We did, we did this, we did it. But we, the man was not guilty. And NDLA can also come out and say, it was in his house, so not him himself was partaking those drugs. Because they have to come out. But now that the media uh, preparers have gone on this particular issue, a lot of Nigerians now, in local areas, in the interior part of the world, say, ah, senator is taking drugs. Is it, that, and that was, that's what the man is afraid of. Because he can kill his political career. Yes. Someone in the person of uh, one late senator from Ogun State was, was accused of uh, drug peddling. A lot of things were done against the man. That particular incident killed that man. Gave him an heart attack and he died. If I'm a senator from uh, Ogun State, if I could remember his, his name, you get it. Because of this kind of issues. So, the senator, if I'm the senator, I will sue NDLA to court. For defamation. Exactly. Because an NDLA would now go and defend what they have said. Because now a lot of Nigerians will have the mindset that, oh, Senator Ashiru is a drug peddler, is a cocaine dealer. That's what they will be telling. Meanwhile, the man doesn't know anything about it. Maybe it's his driver, his cook, one of his children's friends that came to the house and drug some drug uh, case in the house. And NDLA came and picked it up. I know such news make big fish. Yes. And people will always fish on big fish and that's what NDL is doing but maybe this time around they are, they are biting a big finger they cannot even take care of <laughs> because that's what <laughs> well, I see this kind well, of issue well, well I, I believe the law catches up with whoever is guilty mm -hmm. respective of how big you are well mm -hmm. of course except for white lions like uh, the one from Kogi states no no his, uh, his days are numbers <laughs> let's let tell ourselves the truth 
white lions or black lions in Kogi State, former governor. Is they, see, yeah, the way EFCC will rubbish that man. The way they will rubbish that, that man. EFCC is, is being slow to action. No, 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 no. It's because of public opinion. The day that man went to EFCC office to go and surrender himself, if EFCC had picked him up, they would have, that governor that followed him would not have, there would be a resistance. Yes. And there could be a shootout. So yes, he's just timely, timely looking at you know there's a court case. Yes. The court has asked him to appear. Yes. That is where they will pick him. That is the right avenue to pick him. So if anything happened there, if it's like if we shoot out, it can happen because that is the right place EFCC can pick him up. Because the moment court pronounced that he should be reminded in EFCC custody. Who is that governor that wants to stop him from being reminded? And there's no shopping of any court judgment they want to do now that EFCC is prepared for them, they will not they will not get uh, uh, a So for EFCC, they are just watching him. They are waiting for the day he will come to court and they will pick him up. And that is the right place to do it. They can't do it in any public. They can't go to any house because there will be protests, there will be this. So in the court premises, they will pick him up. And that's what EFCC is waiting for. Well, let's uh, take a look at some political stories mm -hmm. now. We've been ham hammering on uh, some socio-economic exactly. uh, stories. Let's exactly. take a look at politics. Mm. The Ondo gubernatorial polls is just around the corner. Mm. And the People's Democratic Party... Uh, was caught in a trade of words with mm. uh, Al-Hajid uh, Ganduji, mm. uh, an APC chieftain, mm. who blatantly said that, who was boasting that he would capture on those states, mm. as well as other south, southwest states. Mm. Now, the, the PDP told him that such statements would be the end of democracy in the country, because how do you <coughs> use the term capture in a democratic election? <coughs> I think very interesting yes. to that story, and sorry for that cough. No, 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 <laughs> it's, it's so, natural. Uh, that, that, now, what is happening is one of the political intrigues normally see by a politician making statement, you know, out of their anxiety, out of their consciousness yes. to always impress their supporters, impress their people, impress everybody that they are working. So if Ganduja is saying they are going to capture the entire, uh, on those states, capture the Southwest states who are under PDP, it's a political statement. I don't see that ending any democracy because Dangote is just one man. Is it safe to say that the PDP just overreacted or is overreacting to the state? These are the same statements that PDP leaders in the past have been making. Is it today they are saying see, most of these political statements are learned? People learn it, people hear it, they read it. It's the same statement some of PDP them leaders have made said in the Edo gubernatorial polls that ended. That exactly. And all the local government elections that have been conducted in the state that PDP is sweeping here and there. Didn't the governor say we are going to sweep? If we'll you say you are going to capture, <laughs> you are going to sweep. What is the difference between sweeping and capture? It's the same terminology. It's just that it depends on your interpretation. So, yes. for me, what PDP should be doing is that they are not working. Yeah. In those states, they are not working. In those states, they tried a little. But in those states, PDP is nowhere to be found in those states. In terms of this current electionary campaign that is going. It is APC that is just doing campaign. And AAC, AAC candidates, they are doing campaign. AAC candidates even doing far, far campaign more than PDP candidates. Uh, APC can is going to interior part of uh, Undo State, all the water areas campaign. A young guy like that campaigning for to be governor on uh, Undo State. But what is PDP doing now? The same problem they created for the same in Undo uh, Edo State. They created that same problem in Undo State. The candidate that's supposed to win, everybody went to court. The national is supporting the candidate. The state is supporting the candidate. The executive at the state level is in disarray. All the big wins of PDP in Undo State have a mass moved to APC. So what do you expect? So. When a party is not prepared for election, they will be looking at loopholes, some gaps in statement of people. Meanwhile, they're supposed to go to the campaign field and campaign. And, and, and what is this uh, particular trend of, of recurring accusations of Rex, INEC Rex in, uh, in states mm. during elections, either uh, governorship elections mm -hmm. or local government elections of collaborating with perhaps the ruling party, mm -hmm. APC, uh, to sort of uh, rig the election in some way. Now, PDP again is saying that the REC in the Ondo election that is coming up is collaborating with APC leaders and displaying a clear partisan bias in the in the entire picture of the election. By the time that man is removed now, they will say they have went and bring a more sophisticated person that will rig the election for the, for the APC. It never ends. It never ends. Politicians always have this intense accusation against themselves. Just to win sympathy of people, just to draw emotion of supporters, and just to create a, a noise, a narrative around an election that, that okay, somebody is trying to pull a string. We know that it is already happened. Even if it's PDP that is in power in that state, 
and the PDP is in power in national. APC will accuse them of the same thing. They did the same thing in uh, those states. All the noise, uh, they are doing this, they are doing they are arresting people. At the end of the day, we discovered that nobody was arrested. Yes. Even the people that plan to go and kidnap themselves, they let that come out to come and vote. I hope you hear, you hear the story. People who plan to go and kidnap themselves and hide themselves somewhere, they came out and vote. So, this is all political shenanigans of politicians. Except you are very, very sensitive. You will not pay attention to some of these things of politicians. Because they just want to create that noise, create that atmosphere, make, ev make everything look so, so doom. Yeah. So that people feel that, okay, ah, that election... Is and then it is the same people. Ask me, the people that are in PDP in those states, are they are the people that were disfranchised when uh, uh, the former governor, the late governor was there. And they left and joined PDP. If you remember. So they are back. So now there is no chance for them. And the current the governor now was almost denied becoming a governor when uh, late, uh, Akere Dulu died. But he's now there making the gunshot and, and, the, and uh, making every announcement to make sure that APC win the election. So politicians will always find a way to always accuse themselves of all the shenanigans but for us the nigerians just pay attention if you are in those state for to vote go and vote for your right candidate forget all these noise that politicians are making they always create that atmosphere make it look so doom make it look so a, a place of no go area and then the day election will be conducted the person that's supposed to win will win either a piece of pdp will win but the issue is that the political factor either the national cannot be ruled out and pdp is making this noise because when they were there at the national and at the state they do that. So when the is also there, at the state, at the national, they always do that. So it's like, if I'm there today, it is my turn to do everything possible to ensure that uh, our candidate is sustained, our election is victory. While, while the opposition continues to, to cry lament foul. and cry and cry for, and cry for. If you can't, if you, if, you, if you don't want to cry, join us. That's what APC is doing. <laughs> and that's what PDP is doing. If you don't want to cry, join us. Join the party. Become the bad wagon. And let us create the atmosphere for you to enjoy get recruitment, get board member their appointment, recruitment and a contract, and that's how they survive by politicians in Nigeria. Well, interesting. I, I think there's uh, also another story here in the news. <laughs> we have just about uh, uh, five to ten minutes to wrap up mm. uh, this particular segment of mm. conversation on Morning Express. Now, it's on the issue of uh, insecurity in the country. Mm. Uh, one On one hand, the defense headquarters has warned Nigerians or people in general calling for a military takeover. This is coming in the wake of the chief of army staff being allegedly sick and mm -hmm. out of the country, mm -hmm. but the DHQ has refuted that claim, stating that he's on his annual leave. Mm -hmm. The Nigerian army has issued a statement that there is now an acting chief of army staff, while the DHQ refuted the statement, saying there is nothing like an acting coas. Mm. Is the military is is the military in this area at the moment? I don't think so. I think the media is one blowing some this issue out of proportion. Okay. And I have to blame our yellow citizen who normally do this online journalism. They don't the blowing out of proportion. Most of us are in the media. Yes. We write reports. We do news. We can turn one story into ten framing. Yes. And that's what is happening. The army came and said we have a, a we have a someone called strategic and policy who is like deputy to the chief of army staff that will be handling affairs affairs and that's always been there so why write a report and said is that yeah that first person has been appointed as a chief of army staff it's coming from the media and that's why and, when an acting chief of army staff. yes and when the GHQ saw that report they quickly came and said no there was nothing like that and the report written by all these yellow citizens on online media are now making it look as if it was the army that made that announcement it's quite sad and this also goes to the issue of people calling for coup Mm -hmm. calling for military to take over. It's quite sad that people who doesn't even know the, the character and nature of the Nigerian state or the character and nature of the military are calling for military coup. If there is a military coup and military coup, do you think so you, all this uh, social media thing will be working? Freedom will be taken. The first thing the military will do is they will take away your freedom. And one of the areas of freedom they will take away is social media. To they will just lock up all the social media. System. Definitely, they will lock up the social media platform. Yeah. All this one texting, whatsapping, Facebook, you will not do it again. All the TikTok, you will not do it. All this social garden that you are doing, also, you will not do it. So when, is it that people calling for this military coup are somewhat within the military or people who are sympathizers of the Nigerian military or a third example or a third um, uh, a category of hmm. people is the the set of people who do not really understand the freedom that comes with democracy in a country it is it is confusing that uh, we can take it from all the segments that you have mentioned. all right let's let's start from now the the, the 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 elite who are differentiated from the economic distribution yes. economic allocation are angry with the system 
then followed by retired military people who are also defranchised, who are not getting appointments, who are not getting contracts, who are not getting close to the power. It's really their pension they are enjoying. They also defranchised with the system. Then the, the middle class people who are also surviving by way of uh, uh, stooges and doing one or two service for the elite, who are not getting as much as they expected, also calling for such things. Then the poor people who don't know their left and right regarding the nature and character of military government are also calling for because they believe that the current government is not doing enough because of the high cost of living in the country. So for me, it's a segment of the elite plus a middle class who are also disfranchised or taken out of this equation and the poor who are generally impacted by the failure of the, the elite generally to impact Nigeria positively. Now, what is happening is this. The military have been there for many years. We all experienced them for over 38 years. They were in power in Nigeria. We all saw what they did. One of the key problems that military has is that they are very good in terms of administration. Though, but one of the key problems that is freedom of expression. They will not allow that to be taken for granted. And social media has come to stay. Digital uh, space has come to space. That taking, people are it not away, taking it away will be like taking the country more than 20 years backward. No, no, no. They are not taking it backward. What they are going to do is to stop that free flow of expression that people can quickly gather, everything organize. Will, everything becomes regimented. Regimented. Now, the one, but one good thing about them is they come to power. Like what is happening in Mali, Burkina Faso, and the and, uh, 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 Nigerian Republic. That the military government now taking hold of the economy. Price control is one of the things that military normally use to appeal to the people. From 1966 to 1979, then from 83 to 86, one of the key things that the government did then, before the SAP came into the Babangida government, but one of the key things that Abacha did was he used price control to checkmate the excesses of businessmen and women. And that is what is lacking in democracy. Civilian government can't do that because they capitalize the economy. They can't capitalize the economy. They can't they, they themselves are the capitalists. Yeah, now. So they can't install that price control mechanism into the economy by, like today, they are selling bag of rice for one hundred and thirty thousand. Who uh, born you where to sell bag of rice for one hundred and thirty thousand? When the government give you license to import, regime. they control it. Even if, 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 if you want to be so stubborn about, they seize it and share it to the people for free. So that's what that's the, that when poor people are saying the military should take over, they're only looking at that aspect of where they can have access to cheap food. Yes. But when the elite are calling for takeover of government, they're looking for opportunity to take over the government and impose their will on the people. So you can understand the angle where the poor people are coming the from. Dynamics. The dynamics of what the people, the poor people are like, let us have cheap food. If the military come to power, there will be cheap food. They can control price of goods and services. But when the elite are calling for power to change, what they're looking for to take over that power, to be part of it, and be doing what this current government is doing in their own stake. So we must understand that. But for me, it's two things. Your freedom is very important. If you don't have freedom, the military government doesn't guarantee that for you. They will even tell you, a lot of us who are analysts can be picked up pick up anywhere we are. We may not even have opportunity to. This is all the private media that you are seeing springing up. All of them will sh shut down. The only government media houses and some few of them that have, have, have alleged to the military that will functioning. So we must understand. Then secondly, all this noise that people are making, all this, they won't, all these CSOs that are coming in, coming out, making statements, you won't be able to do that again. So we must understand that because military is seized that freedom. But when it comes to economic enrollment, economic empowerment of the people, they have that leverage to spread money ab abroad. But one thing is that they are very, very serious when it comes to corruption. They may ignite a decree that put corruption as capital punishment. And that's what civilian government cannot do. And eventually a lot of people will lose their lives. They will lose their lives, including it, innocent it, individuals. It, it, it's an already corrupt system exactly. that we are trying to clean up. Clean up. Well, well let's also talk about the same uh, military and insecurity as well, mm -hmm. where the federal government is uh, beaming a searchlight on uh, personnel selling mm -hmm. arms, especially within the military. Mm -hmm. Now, a report here says that in the last four years, 10 soldiers have been arrested mm -hmm. in relation to selling uh, military arms mm -hmm. or ammunition mm -hmm. to either bandits, uh, terrorists, or just criminal elements in the society. Now, mm -hmm. experts have also said that the federal government should not only channel this energy towards the Nigerian military, mm -hmm. but also some paramilitary exactly. agencies as exactly. well as the Nigeria police. Exactly. It is expected because okay. the, the police is even more guilty of these challenges. I know the police who are wearing jobs. They are. They are. The tomorrow, an inquiry was, was to set up and find out how much of ammunition is Nigerian police having? How much is needed? How much? Today, nobody can come out with that audit. Just say you want to carry an audit of the 
police ammunition today or civil defense or any of the security agency there will be quarrel there will be problem because apart from the ammunition missing there's also the contrast splitting within that area if you remember some few years ago there was this agitation that we want to begin to check the budget civil society should begin to check the budget of military police and the rest of them they came and said no you cannot check our budget because we have the authority to to fire and hire and recruit and do this and do that and everybody kept quiet because that could instigate military coup because if the government is so serious about that or national assembly there will definitely be a challenge to that yes. that is what i said now police also need to be could should also be a searchlight on police a lot of armed cases have been established that the use ammunition of police DSS also need to be, there should be also be a searchlight on that. And this has to be from the Office of National Security Advisor. But whether he has the power, the will to do that, and that's what we don't know at this point. But we just hope that more people will be arrested and will be prosecuted in this regard. But, but in, in, in closing now, mm. it's uh, just about three minutes to mm. wrap up this conversation. What do you think is perhaps the major cause of this um, disintegration, especially in the military with some bad elements uh, taking up arms from the armory or from wherever to push to criminal elements in the society hmm. is, is it a matter of welfare not being adequately um you know renum remunerated to the hmm. military hmm. personnel or could it be an, a case of greed or corruption what exactly are we looking at uh, from a broader perspective i, I think they are the military men is civil service men they are all in the Nigerian society Everybody facing the same challenges that we are facing, yes. high cost of living and the rest of inflation challenges, you know. But you already sign up to a deal. To collect, if your salary is 200000 or 150000 that's what you have signed up. So if you are living beyond your means, and you are not a greedy and corrupt military person, now selling the arms will not be the channel of you to make more money. It's wrong. You have to be put out of that service. You have to be put out of circulation in, 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 if, if that, that would be the case. Because what you sign up of is your wage bill which has been paid to you so any other thing that is coming up you're not supposed to be engaged in that and again if we have obsolete military equipment in our warehouses if there's any need for the government to sell them let it be known because some of those ammunition could be ammunition that have been kept for many many years not being used in one uh, damaged warehouse or the vessel and they will just take advantage of like the one that happened in Kano, yes. whereby a brigade commander was not selling uh, used vehicles of military Maybe there was no uh, proper channel communication on what to do about those equipment. And that's why the man went and sent it to Panteka. Be, be, now he's not being punished for... <laughs> because he, he, thought, he thought nobody would... Uh, exactly, he asked for it. it. Because it has been long they have been there. It happened. You see, go to Federal Secretary. You see, abandoned truck, vehicle, that or government. That will never be used again. That will not be used again. If government, now, if someone, one person should go and steal one of those vehicles, now they say, ah, it's, it has been stealing government property for a long time. Meanwhile, these properties have been there. If we were to auction them, let us auction them and get some money for the government and put it in a vault. Better than allowing some people to take advantage of it. They will not cut them or arrest them and begin to call them and we about thief. All right, Mr. Defolarin, I must thank you so much for always being a very, very good chat on the program. Thanks for uh, having it's, me. It's wonderful to have you here and uh, it's been a very informative conversation as well. Thanks for having me. Thank you.